Well, hello everyone, wherever, wherever you are in the world, and a very, very warm welcome to our insight session with myself, John Harris, and Larry Tweed from the USAID CTJ project. We're absolutely delighted to provide this insight video ahead of the November 2020 Central Asia Trade Forum. And one of the key themes that we wanted to pick up on was the importance of skilling, upskilling, learning and development to really help with trade advancement and riding out the current coronavirus crisis. I work for the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. And if you haven't heard of us, we are a global professional institute. We are a membership organization and we work independently with a wide number of professionals, organizations and government agencies across the world, promoting excellence in logistics and transport. And we've been lucky to work alongside Larry Tweed for the last two to three years, delivering a skills project here in Central Asia. And so Larry is going to pick up on the value of human capital later on in our webinar. Now, if you're interested in understanding a little bit about CILT, just go to www.ciltinternational.org and there you'll find a wealth of information all about CILT, what it's achieved, where it's come from. Now, the headline is that it's come from the UK, but it is now a global organisation working in over 40 countries across the world. And the way that that works is that we have what we call branches and territories of CILT that provide locally relevant training events and a whole host of development activities for women, young people, those wanting to advance their careers. Now, in addition, we have training providers that we work with across the world, and we've been delighted to start to develop that strand within the Central Asia region over the last couple of years. Now, in the Central Asia region, CILT has been active since 2017, and CILT Kazakhstan provide the central hub for all our services across Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. But that wouldn't have been possible without teaming up with USAID and the Competitive Trade and Jobs Initiative has really helped us to accelerate growth and awareness of the training and mentoring and support activities available. Now, the CILT International Vision Statement is all about promoting excellence and being the leading professional body. We don't just focus on supply chain and logistics, but we focus on all of the wider things that are involved with moving people and goods locally, nationally and across the world. And you can see the kind of technical areas that we're involved in here, rail, bus, ports, freight forwarding. And some of these will have more relevance to the Central Asia region, particularly within some of the more landlocked countries than others. But we hope that you will find our skills session here informative and helpful. Now, you'll find us working across the world. You can see the spread here. And it's not just in Central Asia. You'll see a strong presence within South Asia, East Asia and Southeast Asia. And the beauty of CILT is that we bring together people from uh, developing countries, um, more mature economies and fuse them together. We're united about the purpose of promoting excellence in logistics and transport. Now, in terms of our learning, we have a new competency framework that has just been launched and developed this year. And at the heart of this is being able to equip people to do the job that they say they can do. They are, as we say, doing what it says on the tin. So at the heart of this is your personal effectiveness and the fact that any individual, whether you're in rail, whether you're in aviation, whether you're involved in container shipping, should be effective both as a leader but also as a learner. Around that we expect every professional to be able to understand the issues of risk management, good project management, how to use IT and data effectively as tools, but also how to lead to manage and engage with their customers. 
And then around this framework is the technical areas that you are used to. So whether you're an operational manager, whether you're a strategic leader, whether you're involved with urban transport planning and how that works, all of those technical areas fuse together. And whilst your career to date may have specialised in one of them, it's really healthy to have an understanding of where you fit in the jigsaw. And that's a part of the work that we've been doing more locally in Kazakhstan and the Central Asia countries. Now, one of the things that CLT is all about is building training and professional development capability. And that means that it's not just about passing exams and learning facts and figures. It's so much more than that. It's about being competent in the job that you are in and the job you aspire to be in. It's about looking to be a member of CILT. And that means that you actually are assessed as a member or chartered member or even a fellow grade, but also making sure that you can apply what you know effectively. And that means that if there are gaps in your skills and knowledge, as we have found through some of our research in Central Asia, there are easy ways to plug those gaps. And we'll talk about that in a bit. If you go onto our website, you'll be able to download our document, which is called our key knowledge areas. Now, this is all about driving knowledge and delivering quality. And copies of these are available in English from the website. And if you require a copy in Russian, please do contact me. And my contact details are at the end of this webinar. The important thing about our key knowledge areas is no one professional knows everything. We all rely on being connected and learning from each other. However, to develop as a rounded professional, you need to have breadth and you need to have depth. And the breadth bit is around being able to take knowledge and apply it sensibly into situations. The depth is your technical or managerial expertise within a niche area. And at CILT, we're committed wherever you are in the world to try and stretch you and develop you both in the breadth and depth of what you know and what you can apply. Now, in 2020, we carried out some detailed insight work across the world, looking at how our training providers have weathered the storm created by COVID-19. Now, over 65% of our partners came back with some very helpful feedback. And you can see uh, the widespread of engagement. Now, since this first survey, we've actually done two more. And there's even been further representation from the Asia region. Really comprehensive feedback. And it's given us a real insight into how businesses and those involved within training have adapted. Now, the first thing that we ask people is, well, what does this mean about your immediate um, short term plans? How are you going to cope uh, with this? And there are some fairly standard things here. But one thing it assumed is that everybody would be able to go online. And from some of the research that uh, we've seen from OECD and others about the importance of being digital and being connected in the Central Asia region, this can sometimes be a challenge. So globally, whilst there was a big push to go online and provide ongoing access, nevertheless, it remains a real issue um, in some countries where uh, the technology is not yet in place fully to be able to participate in Zoom or other online learning portals. Now, we ask people, what happens if you have to work as a virtual learning centre? What do you want to be able to do? And the screen here shows a number of things that we've now been trying to put into place to support our training partners. And we've also swung these into action, working with CRT Kazakhstan more locally. One thing to flag is our central knowledge centre. And this is an online library that you can actually log into um, as a member within uh, the UK. And anyone on our training courses uh, run by CLT has been given access to be able to use that resource. Now, let's move forward to the future. So people are beginning to think, well, what will actually happen and what will be popular? Now, this really clearly shows that the 
the blended approach of learning. So no more are we just going to be all online or just physical. This is going to be about putting together training and learning that is tailored and that works for the individual business. It's about adapting it so it's customized. And it's also about making sure that the learning mix matches the culture of the people and the organization. So no two companies are the same. There would need to be a sensitive mix of face-to-face, -face, online and physical attendance in order for it to work. And what this shouts really loudly is that training isn't going to be the same. It's going to be flexible and it's going to have to rely heavily on listening to the needs of the organization and what the management team and those on the shop floor want from training and learning products. Now, what does this mean for Central Asia? I've set the scene about CILT globally. Well, in June 2020, um, OECD produced a really helpful report, which looked at the impact of COVID-19, particularly on the Central Asia region. And the research looked at a wide range of issues, so economic, fiscal, governmental, social and health. And the link to the report is there. Now, we have used this report as a real cornerstone for us to think about the kind of products and services that need to be promoted across the Central Asia region through CILT over the next six to nine months. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what those are. The OECD report was very, very clear that the economic impact will challenge emerging economies. It will have an impact on the Central Asia uh, trade corridors. At a macro level, it'll affect exports and trade, and that also public health and other areas of social change will have to be addressed. And also there was an issue around inequities around who's impacted. So, for example, the issue of gender and women uh, leaders, women managers, those in the economic workforce that are being productive, and the impact of them returning to more of a carer and home-based role in order to support the wider family and what that means economically. So our response to this has been trying to think about ways to upskill and develop businesses within Central Asia. And we have a pilot project underway, kindly supported by USAID, which is looking at how we mentor and support businesses to address their COVID crisis, solve their technical problems and get there quicker. Our focus is therefore on something called the Business Support Programme, and I'm going to explain a little bit about that in a minute. As part of that, we're carrying out skill gap assessment, not only within the business themselves, but also carrying out skills assessments of our own expert advisors that have been recruited to look at what they need to become rounded consultants and to be able to go out effectively and advise businesses how to cope during the COVID crisis. Mentoring is no stranger to CILT, and we have a number of effective mentoring schemes around the world, Australia, Sri Lanka, uh, which in incidentally specializes particularly in women's needs, our women in logistics and transport movement, and also as part of standard activities. So this is, for example, the UK mentor pack that is given out to professionals wishing to give time to support uh, their younger counterparts. Now in Central Asia, the way that we've taken this is into what we call the BSP, the Business Support Programme. And this went from a standing start in around about April time to delivery starting within June, July. And this is designed to, to recruit around 25 to 35 um, business expert consultants in different areas, human resource management, IT, leadership, organizational change, supply chain management. And for them to be able to go into small, medium enterprises and really get down to the sweet spot of where their problems are because of COVID and how they want to get out of them. Now, we've provided mentoring and coaching to those individuals and got them ready for business. And their first assignment started uh, late August, early September this year. 
and we're monitoring this very closely. The beauty of the approach is that there are four ways that we can help an organization. That's either through direct advice and consultancy, where you kind of give them the answer, but also through facilitation and focus training, through business coaching of the senior leadership team, and also through technical mentoring, where we are trying to help the individual company solve it for themselves as far as possible and leave the skills retained within the organization. So at the end of this pilot program, um, which is running at the moment, we expect to see the expert advisors developed, but we also expect to see businesses helped in the here and now because of their COVID challenges. And hopefully they will take some of those messages into the way they work and run their businesses in the future. Now this slide summarizes what the BSP program is designed to do. Although it is underpinned with core funding at the moment from USAID, we are expecting this to be able to be a sustainable um, offer from CILT that will allow technical, operational, managerial and leadership development in years to come. It is targeted at small to medium enterprises or smaller business units within larger companies. And this will give them a chance to take some of their lessons learned during the COVID stage into a steady state. The key to this is building a sustainable long-term business model. And through CILT's program of what we're calling online masterclasses and webinars, we hope to maintain the interest and there is already a waiting list for this program. Now, in conclusion, what does this mean for the Central Asia Trade Forum? What does it mean for the kind of things that we'll be discussing? at our CILT panel event. Well, there's a few things to take away. Building the capacity of small and medium-sized businesses in Kazakhstan and the other Central Asia countries is vital for economic development and recovery. Small businesses are a powerhouse, but they need to be incubated and they need to be able to grow. What about the social impact? So we have to ensure that women, are empowered to be able to develop to their full potential and receive the training and nurturing that they need for their entrepreneurship and their own businesses to be developed properly. What about speeding things up? Without some form of intervention, we will see perhaps a slowdown and therefore in order to support the supply chain, it's vital that those small businesses have the confidence to actually move forward with their business plans and move forward in applying some of the advice given so that it makes a real difference. Now, our work is very much at the micro. Ideally, we can only be supporting around about 30 to 50 businesses through this program, but they cover a wide range of industry sectors. However, starting small, and doing it in this bottom-up way can also help the macro picture. It's the difference between a business either deciding to close its doors, deciding to reduce the number of staff, through to a business actually seeing a niche in the market and providing a really valuable service during this time of uncertainty and into a steady business state. And finally, CILT as an organization is here to support. We are here to be a bit of a, a glue function within the education and training space, but also within this direct business support arena. We can't do it without effective partnerships. And that's why working with the CTJ project, working alongside um, our colleagues in testing this out has been so, so valuable. I hope that's helped set the scene and get you thinking about who CRTR, why we're involved in Central Asia, and particularly the things that we care passionately about in terms of helping industry locally within your countries. Now, let's turn to Larry Tweed. We're delighted to have worked with him over the past two or three years on these projects. And Larry's going to unpack this a little bit more, talking about the value of human capital in tackling the coronavirus crisis. Thank you, Larry. Okay, so we're talking about transportation and logistics today, um, so I thought it was only appropriate that I give you a little bit of a roadmap of this discussion. 
I'm, I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about my first encounter with CILT and then move on to talking briefly about some transportation logistics challenges in Central Asia. I um, want to provide you with a, a short overview of our CTJ project and our market systems approach. I think that that's um, both important and uh, significant in terms of our collaboration with um, CILT. And then um, I want to talk uh, about our response to the pandemic. And when I say our, I mean the project and CILT because this has been a truly collaborative effort. And then finally, um, I want to answer the question, why should we continue to invest in human capital? So my first collaboration with CILT um, began in 2018, and it was literally in the middle of nowhere. We were 80 miles from the Eurasian pole of inaccessibility. Uh, for those of you that aren't cartographers, this is the point on Earth that is furthest from any port in the entire world. Um, it was there that I met John Harris uh, and Keith Newton. They were eating Chinese food in a town called Korgos, um, and uh, that's on the Chinese-Kazakhstan border. And I figured if these two British guys could find their way to a Chinese restaurant in the middle of nowhere, they must know something about transportation and logistics. It was, it was really good timing. It was quite fortuitous. It, this was 2018 and the World Bank's uh, Logistics Performance Index had just confirmed that um, one of the greatest constraints was the logistics, the logistics sector's gap in skills and that this was dragging down uh, or preventing growth in a lot of the developing countries. These were findings that were also supported by my colleague Aijan and the Transportation and Logistics Partnership here in Central Asia, who had interviewed dozens of companies and uh, identified a lack of skills as a key constraint to, uh, to growth in the, in the transport and logistics sector. So, you know, even under normal times, um, transportation and logistics is uh, extremely challenging. It's, it's a field that is inherently complex, um, it's a volume business, it's extremely competitive, the margins are quite thin, and it's, it's constantly in flux. I mean, uh, along with new technology, it's in flux in other ways where, you know, the changing fuel prices, weather patterns, just changes in supply and demand. So any skills gap is immediately going to put a company at a competitive disadvantage. Now, all of these issues and challenges are amplified in Central Asia for, for a number of reasons. I'm going to go over just a, a few of them. First of all, all of the countries that we work in are entirely landlocked. And Uzbekistan is one of only two countries in the entire world that is doubly landlocked. We're working in an environment that involves vast distances. Kazakhstan itself is the ninth largest country in terms of land mass, and we've got Russia, number one, to the north, and, and China uh, to the east. It's very difficult terrain. It's extremely mountainous. There's different work cultures, um, not only between the different stands themselves, but also uh, between Central Asia and Russia or Central Asia and Europe or China. And there's a lot of geopolitical um, chess games going on in this region. We've got great, we're surrounded by these great powers and um, everybody's vying for interest. And this is sort of the thoroughfare um, from east to west. So if that hasn't given you kind of an image of um, some of the challenges, I've got a short video, very short. Um, this was taken about two weeks ago. So incidentally, that video was taken on the border of Kazakhstan and China. Um, that queue or convoy of trucks is about 30 kilometers long, and it was taking drivers at the end of the queue between four to six days to get to the border and be able to cross from Kazakhstan into China in order to pick up goods and then hopefully bring them back home. Um, this gives you, I hope, a little bit of uh, an idea as to why 
uh, a United States um, Agency for International Development project might be um, working in the region. So as John, as John mentioned, um, we are the Competitiveness Trade and Jobs Project. We're primarily focused on um, facilitating trade between Central Asian countries and the rest of the world. It's a five-year project and it's regional in nature. We're not just working in Kazakhstan. We work here in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. We're working across three, three sectors, horticulture, tourism, and transport and logistics. And I've, um, I've emphasized transport and logistics because it's the, it's the only one of the three that also involves the other two. Um, and we're, we're taking a, a market systems approach to this, uh, to the work that we're doing in this region. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, a little bit more about what that means. So in traditional development uh, approaches, um, there's a tendency to focus on the, the problems that are the most visible. And a lot of times these are kind of the, the main gaps in supply and demand. If, it, if it's an agricultural project, a lot of times we're looking at uh, maybe the supply of fertilizer and seed and other inputs to farmers. In, in, in our case here in, uh, in Central Asia and in the transport and logistics sector, um, as, I, as I mentioned, the, um, uh, the World Bank has identified a major gap in the, uh, in the skills. Um, now, a, a market systems approach is not only going to look at the kind of the core gap in supply and demand, but it's going to look at some of the underlying causes and the systemic constraints. So if you think of the core as supply and demand in a market systems approach, we're also going to be looking at relationships between supporting functions, and those may be banks, educational institutions, associations, um, service providers, as well as um, kind of government and regulations, both um, uh, traditional uh, rules and informal rules. In a traditional approach, it's often more direct. We, uh, the, the project will identify the problem and then they'll, they'll seek a solution. And a lot of times um, that means if, if, it's, if it's training needs, they'll go out to the international market, identify experts, bring them into the country, do a, conduct a training. Those experts will go home and hopefully the idea is that the employees are, are then trained. In a, in a market systems approach, um, our, our focus is a little bit more what, what we call facilitative. We're, we're constantly building relationships and we're trying to make um, connections and market linkages. Our, our solutions tend to be delivered more by local service providers. And if those local service providers are lacking the, the capacity or ability to deliver those trainings, then we'll try and build their skills so that they can deliver those trainings to the workforce. Traditional approaches um, are a little bit more rigid in their construction, while uh, market systems approaches are more agile or adaptive. If something is working well, we can kind of double down on it. And if something's not working, um, we can pivot and try something new. These traditional approaches play a little bit shorter game. It's, it's more focused on the immediate needs, while as market system approaches um, are focused on longer term behavior change. Um, and aligning kind of the, the incentives with the, the market, the longer term market objectives. So there's, there's also a lot of unintended consequences in the traditional approach. Because the project takes more of a direct role and kind of plays, uh, plays the role of the market actor, sometimes this can distort market prices. So if we're talking about agricultural inputs, if it's the project that's buying them and distributing to the farmers, then we're actually distorting the market prices in the local markets. Um, if it's trainings and we're bringing in only international experts, then we may be crowding out the local service providers that, that could be um, conducting those trainings. It also has a tendency to perpetuate uh, dependency on foreign aid. So if everything is being delivered and it's free, um, you're kind of creating this mindset that why should I pay for these services when an international do donor is going to be providing these for free. Um, in a traditional approach, sustainability may be a little bit more of an afterthought. People may talk about it a lot, but in, in reality, um, it's, it's not the most important thing. Whereas in, in our approach, we're really trying to focus on long-term sustainability and being able to deliver 
um, trainings well beyond the life uh, the lifeline or lifetime of this project. So next, I, I would like to transition into how did CTJ and CILT respond to the global pandemic. Um, Love the CILT tagline, Stronger Together, um, a firm believer in collaboration. So, um, you know, when uh, in, in early March, when we started to get a notion that this could be an extremely disruptive pandemic, this was even shortly before WHO announced and called it a global pandemic, we were collaborating with CILT, kind of had our, our fingers on the pulse of what might be happening and started asking questions um, we assessed the situation and we, we tried to anticipate uh, what the needs would be if this was going to impact Central Asia. That seems so far uh, like a lifetime ago, but this was just four months ago. Um, this was before the first case here in Central Asia was even identified. We reprioritized and refocused a lot of our energy um, on medium, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. We realized that the larger firms normally have a little bit more cash flow and capital on hand and would probably be a little bit more able to weather the storm. We moved from analog to digital and by that I mean we had we had originally planned on conducting um, a series of trainings in person having uh, folks travel to a training center and obviously that's not really possible so we quickly said what what sort of platforms are out there for trainings um, we're all familiar with Zoom now, but at that time we weren't even uh, sure which webinar platform might be the best to use in the region. So um, that was that was part of our, our thought process. And we expanded access to relevant content. CILT has a great repository of, um, uh, of content and information. We went in and looked at what might be the most important, what can we deliver right now? So business continuity planning, um, um, crisis management, um, those items were immediately translated, as well as CILT's uh, timely bulletin, which was grabbing information from around the world. We were able to quickly convert that into local language, which is Russian, and get that information out. Um, we also, both as a project and CILT, we encouraged experimentation. We realized that these are uncertain times um, and that not all of our approaches are going to work. It's not all going to stick. Um, but we, we, want, we wanted people to feel confident and comfortable in trying out new things, to try and learn what, what would work. Now, we're already on to my last slide, um, and, and we want to try and answer the question why it's important to invest in, in human capital during a global pandemic. I, yeah, I think the first and most obvious thing is coordination and safety. When, when you bring people together um, from an organization into a training, and if it's in person or online, um, you're, you're providing them with a coordinated approach and you're making sure that everybody is on the same page. And that's extremely important during, during these times when safety is the number one priority and just understanding what the most current information is, um, is extremely important. Investing in human capital also generates value and not just from the business perspective. Obviously, when your business units are operating with maximum efficiency, it's going to elevate and raise the value of your entire organization. And it's one of the reasons why private equity firms actually look at the human capital element when they're, they're making a bid for a, for a new company. But it also raises the, the value of the individual. Um, there's plenty of studies out there that show uh, that when, a, when an individual workforce um, understands what their roles and responsibilities are and they know how to work at a high level, um, that, that their self-worth uh, also, also increases. Now again, when, you're, when your organization is firing on all cylinders, when your operations unit is maximizing their efficiency, your marketing team is going out and finding new business, your customer service team is retaining your current customers um, and helping you stand out from the pack, um, this really, this really helps, uh, you know, you compete. A trained workforce, um, and, and, and Mohammed, thank you, you were actually saying this as well. A trained workforce is going to increase your agility. I mean, when, when, you can, when you can solve on the fly, when you're scenario planning and um, you, you've, gone over, you've gone over what could go wrong and you've gotten your team thinking about these things ahead of time, they're going to be more able to respond 
with, with a good answer when, um, when a problem arises. A competent team allows you to distribute your decision making. When your managers can handle those day-to-day -day challenges and problems that arise and they're not calling the CEO every time to get, to get input or to make, make sure they're making the right decision, um, it allows a leader to step back, which brings me to my final point. When a leader has the time to step back, they can focus more on strategic thinking. This pandemic is not gonna be the last black swan. Um, this has accelerated um, automation and AI, which are going to continue to disrupt this field. Um, the whole idea of globalizations and global supply chains uh, are, are in question right now. So there's a lot of thought that needs to go into this dynamic field and how things are going to be changing in the future. And that's it. That's the end. Um, I want to thank you guys. Well, thank you, Larry, for that really meaningful insight into how you at USAID and the CTJ project have been uh, tackling this, not just through the CILT work, but working in partnership more broadly across the region. Now, if you have found this helpful, please remember to check into our panel discussion, which is due to take place at the beginning of the Central Asia Trade Forum on day one. But in the meantime, you can get in touch with us. So contact details for myself at CILT and also for Larry Tweed at the CTJ project are given here on the screen. We'd be delighted to hear from you either before or after the forum. And thanks again for checking into this webinar.